Uh, hello everyone and welcome to uh, today's session of Lunch with Lymphoma Australia. My name's Beck. I'm one of the lymphoma care nurses and I'm based in Sydney, New South Wales. We also have on the line today Donna Gans, who I'm sure many of you know, but she's the National Nurse Manager with Lymphoma Australia. And also joining us, we're very pleased to have Aggie Jalonka, who's a senior research nurse uh, in haematology, and she's currently practicing at the um, Concord Hospital in Sydney. Um, before we get on to Aggie's presentation, uh, I'd just quickly like to run through some updates and information from Lymphoma Australia. Uh, so, um, our lunch with Lymphoma Australia is we're going to have a little break for September. Um, many of you probably know that uh, September is actually Lymphoma Awareness Month and there'll be some exciting initiatives coming out for that. Um, so we're going to turn our focus to that for September. Um, however, we will be back strong in October. Um, and really, in order to, to come back strong, we'd like to know what you guys would like to hear. So please reach out to us. Uh, via email at nurse um, at lymphoma.org.au with any topics that you'd like us um, to speak on in these sessions. And just also a reminder for you guys um, of our services very briefly. So um, we have nurses based uh, in Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales, but collectively we cover um, all of Australia and you can contact us via the nurse support line. Um, you can also get in contact with us um, through email or also by um, joining the Lymphoma Down Under Facebook page, which is a private page um, with, I think it's around 2,000 members now. So uh, you can often find lots of support and information there as well. In addition to that, we have our website where you can access um, loads of information and also print some resources and fact sheets. And on there, you'll also find um, our video library where you can get um, presentations from uh, national and international experts on all sorts of topics around lymphoma and CLL. And lastly, our newsletter, which um, you can sign up to receive as well. And again, just a reminder that September is Lymphoma Awareness Month and we're really excited about that and, and spreading the message and, and creating awareness around lymphoma which you can do in many ways. So you can go line your way. Uh, we also have developed um, some Zoom backgrounds. So if any of you guys are um, meeting via Zoom, like we are today, uh, you can use our Lymphoma Australia background for that. And lastly, um, creating a lymphoma love bomb, which there'll be some more information coming out around that, but we hope to um, Saturate social media with support and messages of support for those with lymphoma and those who are looking after um, people with lymphoma. So now moving on to our presenter for today, we have Aggie, um, who is a senior research nurse. She has over 10 years experience in haematology um, and oncology clinical trial nursing. She's practiced not only uh, in Australia, but also in leading haematology units in uh, London as well. She's uh, completed a graduate diploma in cancer nursing and has recently been awarded a scholarship to undertake um, a graduate diploma in education as well. Aggie's really keen to share with us today knowledge about haematology and also clinical trials um, with the broader community as well. And knowing that um, the more information we share about this, and the greater understanding that you guys have, the, the, the better access you'll have to clinical trials. She's also um, committed to safeguarding the role of nurses within patient care in a role uh, in an environment that's uh, historically been um, quite non-clinical. So Aggie, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I shall pass the microphone over to you. Thanks very much, Beck. Thanks for your kind introduction. Uh, I shall just share my screen. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good afternoon and welcome to the Lymphoma Australia Lunch with Lymphoma webinar. Our focus today will be on understanding clinical trials, including a look at the historical aspects of research, 
the processes involved in clinical trial management and where to find further information reliably. Research is a systematic investigation carried out to establish fact by answering questions and proving ideas. It includes medical and behavioural research involving volunteer participants that are developed and conducted with the aim of identifying more effective ways of preventing, diagnosing, treating and understanding human disease. All research is carried out according to strict scientific guidelines and ethical principles, thereby ensuring the protection of participants. A clinical trial, therefore, is a research study that tests how well an intervention works in a group of people, analyzes new methods of screening, prevention, diagnosis or therapy, and is conducted in phases. Clinical trials often compare a new product, vaccine, management strategy, or therapy with another that already exists, and information is learned about it, this intervention, its risks and its effectiveness. Clinical trials can be sponsored by various organisations, and these include foundations, medical institutions, and pharmaceutical companies. The world's first clinical trial is recorded in the book of Daniel in the Bible and was conducted by King Nebuchadnezzar, a military leader who ruled in Babylon around 500 BC. Nebuchadnezzar had ordered his people to eat only meat and drink only wine, a diet he believed would keep them in fit physical condition. Several young men who preferred to eat vegetables objected to this, so the king allowed these rebels to follow a diet of vegetables and water, but only for 10 days, after which their health would be assessed. When Nebuchadnezzar's experiment ended, the vegetarians appeared better nourished than the meat eaters, so were permitted to continue their chosen diet. This is a fairly modest example of an experiment that guided decisions about public health. Let's shoot forward a couple of millennia to 1747 and James Lind, a Scottish doctor in the Royal Navy. Although Lind was not the first to suggest citrus as a cure for scurvy, he was the first to study its effects through systematic experimentation. It ranks as one of the first reported clinical experiments in the history of medicine, particularly for its use of control groups. Lind selected 12 sailors who displayed symptoms of scurvy. These symptoms included gum disease, skin problems and fatigue. They were isolated from the rest of the crew, paired up and given one of six different treatments, either cider, a few drops of a weak acid, vinegar, seawater, nutmeg and barley water, or oranges and lemons. After six days, the men who had received the citrus treatment were already back on their feet. The others, to paraphrase Lind, remained weak in the knees. Both of these historical examples provide good examples of why clinical trials are conducted in that they both provided a means of gathering evidence necessary to drive change. Minimising potential harm to patients while maximising possible benefits ensures the safety of wet and well-being of participants is maintained when conducting clinical trials. As such, all clinical trials are approved by an authorised research ethics committee prior to commencement and are always conducted according to the strict principles of good clinical practice or GCP. These principles have their origin in the Declaration of Helsinki which was created in response to revelations at the Nuremberg trials following World War II. The Declaration of Helsinki sought to ensure that human subjects involved in clinical research would, in future, have their rights, safety and well-being placed above all other considerations. Clinical trials in Australia are regulated by codes of conduct that aim to protect participants as well as the integrity of the research. All clinical trials in Australia must be approved by a Human Research Ethics Committee which checks that the research conforms to the requirements of the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research. The role of the Research Ethics Committee also includes protecting research participants, reviewing protocols before trials are approved and protocol amendments as the trial progresses, asking researchers to change protocols when needed, supervising studies from beginning to end, overseeing scientific design to ensure the trial answers the clinical question, mandating informed consent of all participants and enforcing patient confidentiality. Clinical trials typically proceed through four phases. A phase one trial is designed to examine the safety of a treatment, 
by looking at what it does to the body and what the body does with it, and not whether the treatment works against a specific disease. As such, participants recruited to phase one trials may have different diseases. Phase one trials also determine the safest dose that causes the least side effects. Given the potential risks involved in receiving a treatment that is being tested in humans for the first time, the number of participants recruited is usually kept low between perhaps 20 and 50, with the trial lasting a number of months. Phase two trials recruit up to 300 patients to receive the dose and method of adm administration that was found to be the safest and most effective in phase one trials. A larger cohort of patients provides the opportunity to uncover any side effects that weren't apparent during phase one testing. Some phase two studies may also randomize participants to treatment arms that provide differing doses or methods of administration so as to determine which provides the best balance of safety and effectiveness. If enough patients benefit from the treatment offered in a phase two trial and the side effects aren't too harmful, then treatment is allowed to proceed to phase three. Of note, only one third of all investigational products successfully complete both phase one and phase two testing. Phase three trials aim to recruit a significantly greater number of participants, usually between one and 3,000, and run for longer periods of time. They're also often carried out across the globe, thereby providing a more thorough understanding of the effectiveness, benefits, and adverse reactions of an investigational product, given the broader population being exposed to it. Participants continue to be monitored closely for side effects and treatment toxicity, thereby providing the bulk of the trial safety data. Often participants in phase three trials are randomly allocated to either an investigational treatment group or a control group. This is called randomization and helps to ensure that results are not skewed in favor of one group. For instance, if significantly unwell participants were allowed to choose which treatment they received, the overall results may not be as accurate. This is because if one treatment was found not to work as well as the other, investigators could not be certain whether this was because the treatment wasn't as good or whether it was because it was being tested in that specific population. Phase three trials can also be blinded, meaning the participant doesn't know which treatment they're receiving, or double blinded, where neither the participant nor their doctor knows which treatment the patient is receiving. Blinding reduces the risk of bias. This, is ensured, uh, this helps to ensure the reliability of study results so that when doctors are assessing their patients, they are not biased to the outcomes that they are seeing. Approximately one quarter to one third of all investigational products that enter phase three studies successfully complete this phase of testing. They can then enter the market if approval is granted by government agencies on application. We finally arrive at phase four trials. Even after testing a new treatment on thousands of people, its full, eff full effects still may not be known and there may be some questions that need to be answered. For example, an approved treatment may be shown to reduce the risk of disease recurrence, but does this mean that those who are receiving this treatment are more likely to live longer? Are there rare side effects that haven't yet been seen, or side effects that only show up once a person has taken the drug for a certain period of time? How cost effective is long-term use of this treatment, both to the consumer and provider? Not only can phase four trials take years to complete, but a trial's results may lead to a product being taken off the market or restrictions being placed on its use. Before taking part in a clinical trial, investigators are legally and ethically bound to explain what being involved in a trial means to a participant. They must tell participants what the trial is trying to find out, what the different treatment groups are, what the likely risks and side effects are, what the benefits may be, what tests are required, how frequently visits take place, and whether blood or tissue samples will be kept for use in future research. Specific criteria always needs to be met prior to a participant being granted entry into a clinical trial and may include type and stage of disease, age, or existing health problems. If a participant is approached for trial participation, full information about the trial is provided in a participant information sheet. 
a member of the research team will discuss the trial information with a participant and provide them with a copy to take home and read in their own time. It is always recommended that trial participation is discussed with a participant's family or good friends or even their GP, and that plenty of time is taken to think about trial participation is likely to affect one's life. Noting down and asking any questions before making a final decision is also strongly recommended. Remember, clinical trial participation is entirely voluntary. If someone does decide to participate in a clinical trial, they will have to sign a statement to say that they have been told and fully understand what taking part in a clinical trial means. This is called informed consent. A participant cannot enter a trial without signing their agreement. Informed consent is an ongoing process, so participants should always feel able to ask and receive answers to questions during trial participation. Participants can also withdraw from a, withdraw from a clinical trial at any time without giving a reason. This does not affect their ongoing care or treatment in any way. Some advantages of taking part in a clinical trial include receiving treatment that may only be available as part of that specific trial, helping to improve treatment for patients in the future, undergoing more frequent blood tests, scans or other tests, attending more frequent clinical appointments, and perhaps the new treatment working more effectively than standard treatment. However, no one knows this for sure, which is why the trial is being performed in the first place. Having said that, there are also drawbacks to trial participation, and many of them actually link in with the advantages that I've just spoken about. These include experiencing more frequent invasive tests or scans and more frequent clinic visits, the financial costs associated with travel or additional medications that may be needed, time burdens, unexpected or serious side effects. And perhaps something that patients really need to consider is perhaps not receiving any benefit from investigational treatment. The time it takes to get full results from a completed clinical trial is often dependent on a number of factors, including the type of disease the trial is treating, the type of treatment being used, the design of a trial or unforeseen circumstances. For example, clinical trials for rarer diseases often take longer as there are fewer patients available to take part. As such, investigators from several different centres may need to collaborate to recruit enough patients to satisfy the aim of the trial. A trial may also require specialist equipment and extra training to accurately deliver treatment to participants, and therefore may be limited to certain treatment centres because of cost, facilities or availability of staff. Unexpected outcomes during the progress of a clinical trial may contribute to a longer than expected time to completion or may halt the trial entirely. A fantastic example of clinical trial success in the investigational product development is with the family of antibodies. These are also called monoclonal antibodies, targeted therapies or immunotherapy. Antibodies are produced by the immune system to help fight infection. It had long been thought that if antibodies could be created to recognise specific proteins on cells, such as cancer cells, then the immune system could be utilised to target and destroy them. It was also thought that treatment that specifically targeted cancer cells and avoided destroying normal cells would be more effective with fewer harmful side effects in comparison to traditional chemotherapy. In the mid-1970s, researchers took the first steps towards creating such a treatment by developing antibodies that recognised and targeted a specific protein found on B cells, namely CD20. These man-made antibodies worked with the body's immune system to stimulate the death of B cells that had the CD protein on their surface. As B cell lymphomas develop when B cells become ab abnormal, the mode of action of the man-made antibodies was determined to be ideal for their treatment. As such, the first use of this targeted therapy in a patient took place in 1980. Treatment was reportedly tolerated well and resulted in partial disease response, thereby paving the way for monoclonal antibodies to revolutionise cancer treatment and improve patient outcomes. 
Rituximab was the first monoclonal antibody approved for treatment and is an important milestone in the immunotherapy timeline. It revolutionized the treatment of B-cell malignancies by improving overall response rates and survival in both indolent and aggressive B-cell lymphoma. Rituximab works by binding to the CD20 protein on the surface of mature B-cells and B-cell tumors and recruiting the body's immune system to attack and kill these cells. Stem cells in the bone marrow do not express the CD protein on their surface and are therefore not affected by rituximab treatment. B cells return to normal levels within the blood system within several months after completion of treatment with rituximab. The first phase one trial using rituximab in patients with relapsed refractory low-grade lymphoma took place in 1994 and was quickly followed by a phase two trial. Results from both the phase one and phase two trials demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of rituximab in the treatment of these patients which led to the approval of rituximab by the US Food and Drug Administration in 1997. Use of rituximab plus chemotherapy in the first line treatment of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration in 2006, after phase two trials showed a 94% overall disease response rate in comparison with chemotherapy alone. As researchers have learned more about lymphoma cells, newer therapies have been developed that target specific parts of these cells and the pathways they're involved in. Much like the activity of rituximab, the use of these treatments that target specific proteins on cells greatly minimizes the potential toxic effects to other cells in the body that would normally occur with, the, with traditional chemotherapy. For example, rituximab vedotin is an antibody drug combination that is made up of an antibody and a toxin. It targets the CD30 protein on lymphoma cells and once attached, releases the toxin into these cells and destroys them. Brentuximab vedotin is currently available in Australia for use in patients with relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma or anaplastic large cell lymphoma. The immunotherapy pembrolizumab is also used in relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma and targets and blocks a protein called PD-1 on the surface of T cells, which are immune cells. Blocking the PD-1 protein boosts the body's immune response, thereby triggering T cells to find and kill cancer cells. CAR T cell therapy and bispecific antibody therapy take this idea further. In CAR T cell therapy, T cells are removed from a patient and genetically engineered to produce receptors on their cell surface. These are called chimeric antigen receptors or the CAR part of CAR T cell therapy. These special receptors allow T cells to recognize and attach to the CD19 protein on lymphoma cells. The T cells are then multiplied and reinfused into the patient where they seek out the lymphoma cells and launch an immune, immune attack against them to kill them. The Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration has approved a CAR-T product for the treatment of adults with relapsed or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And this product is called Tisagen Lec Lec Lecel. I thought I would get it on the first go, but I didn't. Anyhow, as the name suggests, bispecific antibodies bind to two different targets at the same time and are designed to engage and activate T-cells to kill malignant B-cells. Phase one and two trials looking at the use of blinitumumab in relapsed refractory B-cell lymphoma show that it is highly effective in producing a disease response. However, further phase two and three clinical trials are ongoing to validate these results. I've list listed a few trials on this slide to highlight how some of the treatments I've discussed continue to be used and adapted. The HD10 trial looks to determine whether a chemotherapy regimen containing brentuximab provides as good disease response with fewer side effects in comparison to the standard of care in patients with newly diagnosed Hodgkin lymphoma. The PATRIA trial aims to determine whether omitting rituximab maintenance in patients who are PET negative after frontline treatment comprises outcome. It also looks at whether the outcome for patients who are PET positive after frontline treatment 
can be improved by adding lenalidomide to rituximab maintenance. Lastly, the AMG103 trial examines whether blinitumumab administered subcutaneously is a tolerable method of administration in comparison to the standard route in subjects with relapsed refractory indolent lymphoma. Your first source of information about clinical trials should be either your treating specialist or nurse specialist who will be able to provide accurate, up-to-date information on treatment options. I've also listed some websites which provide different types of useful information, both for patients as well as clinicians. From a clinical trials point of view, however, can I highlight the ClinTrial Refer website? ClinTrial Refer is free to download as an app to your phone or tablet. It can also be accessed as a website on a laptop or desktop computer. It bridges the gap in clinical research and allows more equitable access to clinical trials across disease categories and locations. It delivers current information from all participating sites to users and allows clinicians to review up-to-date information in real time with their patient, including the choice of referral to another hospital offering a specific clinical trial. ClinTrial Refer can be used to search for clinical trials that match specific disease types. It also provides a summary of the type of patients who are able to join a trial and what the trial involves. ClinTrial Refer shows where a clinical trial is, is available and displays contact details for that location. Before I finish, I just wanted to reiterate something that Beck has already mentioned, that September is, is World Lymphoma Awareness Month. So I have, am asking people to not be a lemon and be a lime. The pathway from lab to shelf can be summed up in this lovely little uh, pictogram here. As we've seen, clinical research trials provide the opportunity for patients to access new therapeutic pathways. The most reliable and accepted scientific method to take discoveries from the lab to bedside is by testing the safety and efficacy of interventions by a clinical trial, thereby contributing to the development of new methods of prevention, detection, screening, and treatment of diseases. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Aggie, that was fantastic. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear more and learn more about um, how clinical trials are conducted in terms of their safety and phases, and um, also how long that clinical trials uh, and development of new, new methods of treatment takes. You know, I think we can sometimes forget that um, before a product actually makes it out there, there's been many, many years, if not decades of um, bench translational and um, clinical trial research that has come beforehand. Indeed, indeed. And I think that in a way it's, it's highlighted at the moment with our current COVID climate, where we are often hearing about things like there is a vaccine coming. Yes, you know, we are in development for this vaccine. We're actually, um, there's a lot of time and a lot of effort that goes into developing these sorts of things. So sometimes the promises that come from people who aren't necessarily quite aware of, of what goes into clinical trials and making sure a, a product is safe, uh, may be uh, slightly, um, I don't want to say misleading because that's too harsh a word, but you know, I think people need to be a, li a little more uh, broad-minded about the sorts of information that, that are being presented to them via, via media. Absolutely. Um, we have got some questions that have come through and I think if you click on the chat button, Aggie, you'll, um you'll be able to see some questions that have come through. Fantastic. So I will start from. Um, we have a question here. Can I contact a hospital if I want to join a trial or must I be referred? Uh, if you are already under the care of a haematologist um, at a treating centre, then uh, that is the first person that you should approach about uh, clinical trial participation. Um, they can refer to the ClinTrial Refer um, website or app, or they will also know what clinical trials are being run at your centre. 
um, they will also be able to um, refer you to another treating centre if that trial is not on offer um, at, your, at your hospital. Um, you will always need to be referred to any sort of physician, clinician, and that's for anything, and that includes seeing another haematologist at another treatment centre for clinical trial or for anything else. Uh, what is the advantage of a clinical trial? I hope I have given some of those answers in my presentation. Um, uh, if you have, if you would like a, a more specific answer, right away on the chat button and I'll get to it. Will I need to live close to a clinical trial centre to be involved? Um, yes and no. There are some clinical trials that are only offered in specific centres or specific states. Um, some of these trials uh, some trials offer uh, travel reimbursements. Um, there may be opportunity to be um, housed closer to a treatment centre or uh, for your travel to be um, arranged so that you can uh, participate in the trial and, and get access to specific treatment. Um, ideally, you will um, be treated or participate in a clinical trial within um, within distance of, of, of your home location. Um, there are some instances where patients need to travel quite a bit of a distance to participate in the trial. Um, and that is also something that is um, thought through carefully, I think, before patients are, are signing up for trials. If a trial offers an opportunity for um, a novel agent that may help with their disease, then it's something that is really taken into account. I think, um, again, it's, something that really needs to be considered by, by patients before they, before they agree to participate in a trial, the sorts of time constraints, the sorts of time demands that um, are placed on them and the person that cares for them um, in terms of travelling to treatment centres, making sure that appointments are met, making sure that treatments are met. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of time and thinking involved in, in those sorts of things. Um, let me have a quick look. Will I be out of pocket financially if I take part in a clinical trial? Um, you may well be, depending on who sponsors a clinical trial. If there is a pharmaceutical company that sponsors a clinical trial, often there is some sort of reimbursement that is given to patients uh, for transport, perhaps for mileage, perhaps for parking fees. However, this is usually capped and it's a per visit cap. So if you breach that cap, you will be out of pocket in that respect. Um, if you are required to take um, other medications um, as either not as part of the trial, because all trial medications will be provided to you for free, but if there is anything that you need to use um, to either help with some sort of um, symptoms or your own regular medication, then you will have to keep on going um, and paying for those. Um, you will not be reimbursed for your participation in a clinical trial. I know that for phase one trials in healthy volunteers, oftentimes they are reimbursed because it is uh, a, quite a big time burden on them and they need to be within a treatment centre for a number of weeks so that they can, be, um, they can be monitored very closely. But in the general world of cancer clinical trials, you will not be paid for your participation. You may receive reimbursement for travel, but if there is no... Um, if there is no room for that in the, in the trial budget, then you will not be reimbursed. Um, let me have a quick look here. Are you taken off clinical trials if you fall pregnant? Yes, there are usually clauses within information, patient information sheets that go through um, information about what happens if a participant falls pregnant or if the partner of a participant falls pregnant. Uh, there is oftentimes a lot of very, very careful and close monitor monitoring undertaken in clinical trials for women of childbearing potential uh, if the treatment that they are receiving is likely to cause harm or damage to a, to a, a baby. Um, these sorts of occurrences um, I like to think are very rare because patients are counselled, again, very, very clearly prior to their um, consent to a clinical trial that they need to be very mindful of um, contraception, um, you know, abstaining from intercourse, these sorts of things that really um, keep, keep them and any potential baby safe, I suppose. Uh, yes, you will be taken off a clinical trial because there is no information about what that medication does to an unborn child. Um, let me have a quick look. 
will I have more side effects on a trial? Um, you may, you may not. All patients are different. The expected side effects of a particular treatment are always listed in a participant information sheet. However, um, there may be instances where patients um, develop a side effect that either hasn't been seen before or may have not been uh, may have been seen in another patient but not reported. Um, it really depends on the treatment. It depends how well you are as a person. Um, so the answer to that is yes and no and maybe. Um, do trials get stopped or changed if there is a bad side effect reported? Um, trials can be stopped if a drug is shown to have no effect on a, on a disease. Um, trials can also be stopped if it, a drug is shown to have quite damaging, damaging effects to participants. So uh, that's why real, really close monitoring of patients and really thorough reporting of any sorts of side effects from patients uh, from trial sites to the study sponsor is important. Um, look here. I think there's also a question now um, in the Q&A section, I think. Let's have a quick look. Thank you. Okie dokie. Do haematologists and their teams regularly and as a matter of best practice discuss current, current and planned trials throughout Australia or globally? Can we feel reassured that our specialists are on top of what's going on, given their workloads and demands on their time and skills? This is a super duper question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, all, all physicians, all, all clinicians um, really have more of an onus on them to be up to date with what's happening um, with developments in research through the world. Um, there are so many avenues of information that are available, um, again, both to clinicians and to the general public, that it would be remiss of, of haematologists to not be on top of what they, of what they need to know. Um, centres that are really dedicated to providing clinical trials for their patients um, are, are becoming more commonplace. So I think uh, once upon a time, clinical trials were seen perhaps as a bit of a niche, a niche little subset of a, of a general treatment area where now clinical trials are really the first uh, port of call that um, are considered for patients either as a frontline treatment or um, in patients that have relapsed disease. Um, there are uh, numerous uh, conferences that, that happen worldwide on a, on a yearly basis. Um, these are haematology and also oncology um, organisations that present ongoing results from clinical trials, also pro provide um, final results from clinical trials. Um, and these sorts of, this sort of information is really shared, uh, again, worldwide to make sure that everyone is, is kept um, informed, fully informed, uh, and that, that everyone has a good understanding of what's upcoming, what's working, what's not working, and how to best proceed with patients. Um, I think I, I really like in this question the idea of best practice because best practice is something that is really reiterated very strongly both within the medical field and also for nurses. Um, you know, it's a matter of, of providing the most up-to-date and the most reliable information to patients and, you know, and treatment, of course, you know. In the end, you are helping to make a decision with your patient as to the best course of action for um, for themselves and for the disease. Um, another question we have is, do trials have upper limits for the number of participants and how do they determine numbers? Yes, there are always upper limits for the number of participants in clinical trials and these are dependent on the st statisticians. So there are often um, specific questions that um, researchers are wanting to find um, and that may mean that they need to look at 1,500 people um, with, you know, a dropout rate of X, X percent um, and so that they know that they will, they will actually receive um, a significant number of uh, results or a, a significant amount of results to actually prove or disprove uh, the aim of their trial. So, yes, there are upper limits for participants and it's statisticians that help to determine these numbers. I'm not a statistician and I do not wish to be a statistician. Um, but it is all done, you know, it's all, it's all scientific, it's all statistically guided, it's not a number that's picked out of the air. 
So what happens if you're number 1501? Oftentimes, if um, trial, so trial sponsors will alert trial sites that they are either reaching, uh, or they are getting close to the end of a recruitment, um, getting close to the end, or reaching their recruitment number. Um, and so they will um, ask that sites um, provide any sorts of patients that they are thinking of putting on this clinical trial uh, put forward to the sponsor. Uh, it is very unlikely that patients will, if you are number 1501, you will not get an automatic disqualification. You will, you will, there will be some consideration in terms of allowing you to potentially take part in the study. If you, if you meet all inclusion, ex, inclusion criteria and don't meet any of the ex, exclusion criteria, um, it's not a cut and dry. You are, you know, you are past the cutoff. You can't, you know, you can't consider this. Um, there are discussions with uh, people called medical monitors who are part of the research team. Um, and these sorts of discussions are take, take place between trial sites um, and sponsors to try and find out the best, best course of action if this sort of thing happens. O oftentimes though, we are always informed that there are um, targets that are, that are soon to be met. So we need to really be very mindful that um, any patients that are approached for potential clinical trials know that they may need to wait a little bit to see if they are actually eligible. Um, let me have yeah, a one more come in um, through the chat. Um, okay. The chat section from Anne. Do trials always stick to the age recommended? Yes. If it's an inclusion criteria and you don't meet the inclusion criteria, then you're not eligible for a trial. I can Unfortunately, just it's as simple as that. On that, um, on that topic, can you tell me a little bit about why we have inclusion criteria? Like, what, why do the trials need them? So really, it's again helping to, um, I guess, minimise the group that is being studied. Um, you want to see how certain treatments um, affect patients in certain age groups. Um, there are some treatments that may be quite um, toxic um, and may not be tolerated as well in, in certain age groups, in patients with, of a certain age. Um, there may also be um, patients or there may also be underlying health conditions that a patient may have that may be affected by the treatment that is um, being used um, so that the investigational product may exacerbate an existing, um, existing health condition. Um, and we also want to make sure that patients are kept safe. You know, the, the, the overall, the overarching, even though we're asking patients to volunteer and, and participate in clinical trials, patient safety is, is still number one. And inclusion criteria helps us to maintain patient safety, a level of patient safety, um, and, you know, not meeting specific criteria tries to ensure that you're kept as safe and, and as well as possible in, in circumstances. Great, I think that might be all of the questions. Oh, actually, I think you've up to an A. One more late one coming in. <laughs> if a trial is being sponsored by a drug company and the results are borderline for success, how is pressure avoided on the researchers? Who monitors the ethics at that point and what if it works well for some patients? The trial is being sponsored by a drug company and the results are borderline for success. How is pressure avoided on the researchers? I presume by researchers, you may mean um, site specific researchers, so doctors, um, or you may mean researchers at that drug company. I'm not too sure, so maybe I'll answer for both. Um, a clinical trial will progress until it shows that there is either success or no success with a, a specific treatment. Um, who monitors the ethics at that point if it's borderline? Well, because there is no, you need to wait for a definite outcome of a clinical trial. Borderline may mean that it goes either way, I suppose. Um, you know, research ethics committees are always looking at, um, uh, I suppose, ground level, ground level, um, ground level things associated with this, but there are also other um, committees that, that examine the overall um, progress of the clinical trial from a higher point. Um, there are either um, 
Oh, Beck, help me out. I'm thinking of DMC and that sort of thing. Um, I've lost my I've lost my acronym. <laughs> um, so there are you know there are uh, committees that look at safety and 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 monitor the safety of how a trial progresses. Um, there are often interim analyses that occur during a trial's lifetime, and these are the times that um, a trial can be altered or ceased or halted so that the protocol can be amended to either meet the clinical question more more effectively or halt the trial completely. Um, I'm not too sure if I'm answering your question, question well, though. Sorry, Anonymous. Um, okay. If you want to um, get a better answer, I'm happy to um, get another question if you want to. Um, yeah, and to... if you wanted to reach out um, as well after the session, if, if there's something quite specific that you wanted to chat, feel free to reach out to myself and I can link you in with Aggie um, to get a bit more specific information. Right. And then well, I think we just... had a couple of comments saying, well done, Aggie, and that was great, Aggie. Thanks. Peter, Peter has thanked both you and I, Rebecca. That is fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Sam, thank you very much. And let me just have a quick look. I'm wondering, um, there's just a very quick chat comment from Wendy, and I might read it out because it's quite interesting in terms of um, ClinTrial Refer. So Wendy says to us, it's a personal comment, I use ClinTrial Refer to keep searching for a trial that I would qualify for, given that I wouldn't qualify under the PBS and I couldn't afford to pay for it privately. While I didn't find that specific trial, I did find a trial that I qualified for and it's been effective in putting her back in remission. So that is super duper news and that's a great, great example of using um, a, source of, of, a source to find further information for your treatment. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's a great example right there. Um, so I think that's the end of our questions. Um, but thank you all for joining uh, in today's Lunch with Lymphoma Australia. And a special thanks to you, Aggie, um, for dedicating your time and, and coming to have a chat uh, with us and, and um, patients today. Hope from that you all have a better understanding of clinical trials. I know I certainly do. And a little bit about um, how they're run and managed. If you do have any questions that weren't answered today or you didn't get time, do reach out and we can uh, link you in with who you need to speak to. Uh, and also if you need some help navigating uh, ClinTrial Refer or any of those uh, search engines that Aggie mentioned in her uh, presentation as well, we can help you with that. Um, almost lastly, please do complete the survey that will come around after today's session. It really helps us to get your feedback so that we can continue to improve. Uh, and I think that's pretty much all from us. Donna, did you have anything that you wanted to? Just the last minute thing, I guess, as well. We do have the, um, the Understanding Clinical Trials fact sheet, which is on our website too, and that has a list of all the ClinTrial Refer app and, and a little bit about what Aggie actually has talked about today too. So do check that out if you have more, more questions. Thank That's you. Thanks, Aggie. Thank you. Stay Wonderful. safe. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for your time. Bye.